Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Today's psalm is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 10. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my iniquities. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. transgressions and my sin is always before me against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb you taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than the snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. wash away my sins. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. You're the one I violated, and you've seen it all, seen the extent fully of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step, out of line with you for a long time, in the wrong place since before I was born. What you're after is truth from the inside out. So enter within me, then conceive a new true life within me. Please stand and join in our opening song, Give Thanks for Life, verses 1, 3, and 4. The words will be on your screens.
throughout the Lenten season, we have been selecting prayers and poems by others today. We have a poem by Virginia Kimball called Something to Pray About. In hatred, there are no brothers, no sisters, no peace. Only roadside bombs, blasting limbs, peace to peace. Exploding minds, crushing hearts and hope, only loathing Sunni for Shiite, stranger for stranger, abomination, widow and legless child, fear in abhorrence, mothers abandoned, fathers terror struck in faithless flight, faith. Where's the comfort of faith? Christians turning on Christians, Palestinians driven out in shame from roadways to work, from homes where children wait with pale faces and huge, hollow, sleepless eyes. Where's the loving mother, our shelter who prays for silence? For men to forget gun belts, caravans going nowhere. Does she belong only to us? Is she our only guide? Only our protection, only for devotion, only. Where's the prophetic voice for us today? Perhaps our prophet is a mother to say, our voice cries out, in the desert make way, prepare a way for the Lord. Make this wasteland right for the way of God. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all mankind will see it together. She cries out, she mourns for her sisters and her brothers. She is mother. She can ponder. She loves with care and waits for the word of God to stand forever. And as we continue, we hear these words from the scriptures. It's the gospel of John, the 12th chapter. We begin in verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, and they came to Philip, who was in Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it. And they said that it was thunder. Others said... An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, 
This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. Here ends the text we have been given for today. May these words be blessed for our hearing, and may in our hearing we be blessed with some sort of understanding. Amen. I'm not a warrior, too afraid to lose. what you call Took a shepherd boy and made him a king. So I'm gonna trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, so you fight for me. I'll be a champion, claiming your victory. So give me faith. sing and shout and shake the wall won't stop until i see them fall gonna stand up step out when you call jesus jesus i'm gonna sing and shout and shake the wall stop until i see them fall gonna stand up step out when you call jesus so give me faith like daniel in the lion's den give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me a hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart As Pastor Michelle was explaining the labyrinth at the beginning of service, I also have had some feedback from those of you online asking, what the heck is the INRI on my stole? What is, what is this? What, is this? what are these letters? Well, they're Latin, and I'm not going to tell you what it means. Go Google it, and then you let me know if you find out. And uh, maybe by Good Friday, I'll, I'll spill the answer if you, if you don't find it. Let us pray together. God, we talk about Lenten journeys, giving up something these 40 days, 40 nights from Ash Wednesday, spiritual reflection, growth. But the heart of the matter is an ever-changing relationship with you and taking just a moment to reflect on who we are before you, where we've been, and in the midst of all these changes in the past year, 
what you call us to be in this moment, in this time, which is very different from times we've had before. How we're church, how we're individuals, how we reflect you in our lives. So meet us in this moment, this Sunday, or whenever we're listening to this service, and speak to us where we are, and move us, Holy Spirit, in the direction you'd call us to be. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Uh, did you ever go to a concert? Maybe you're waiting to meet the band backstage, and you, you're waiting in line to meet somebody famous, or maybe you're a sports fan, and you go to Bourbon A to try and see Khalil Mack or get an autograph or spring training, or maybe in the Bulls' heyday, you tried to shake the hand of Michael Jordan, you know, to get to somebody who you've heard about who's famous, who've made a name for themselves. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're in cosplay and you went to go see the Marvel co convention or downtown for the Star Wars convention that some of us know nothing about. But uh, you wanted to meet, you know, Liam Hemsworth or, or Jeffrey Dean Morgan, you know, somebody you've seen on TV and somebody that you've heard so much about. Well, in today's text, we kind of have that energy. There's some Greeks, they've showed up. They go find Pete, uh, Philip and they say, hey, can you get us in? We want to talk to Jesus. We want, we've heard so much about Jesus. I don't know, maybe they've seen or heard him uh, heal the blind man or feed the multitudes. Maybe they just heard about the public way in which he's debated the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and they just want a backstage pass to say hello. So Philip, much like the telephone game our kids play, goes and tells Andrew. And we get from this gospel, John's gospel, this very unique picture of Andrew, who's not hardly mentioned anywhere else in our text or in our traditions. But in this text, we get that Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. He heard about Jesus through John the Baptist, talking about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He goes and asks Jesus if he can follow him home. Jesus says, come along. He goes and tells his brother Pete. So Andrew's... I guess a guy who, behind the scenes, likes to share his faith and get, bring people in. So Philip to Andrew, they go to Jesus, and Jesus, hey, Jesus, there's these Greek guys, they're wanting to meet you, and Jesus talks about botany. Now there's this kernel of wheat that falls to the ground. Jesus, in reply, in reply to what? In reply to the Greeks who are waiting out back? Are those guys still back there? Because we don't see them anywhere else in the text. For all I know, the Greeks are still waiting to see Jesus or to hear him. They're just completely dropped out of the text. And we have this very unusual, uh, this little, little text we get in, in chapter 12, John's Gospel. Jesus replies, to whom is unclear. And it's, he says, the hour has come. Now, we should ring the bell here because this, thus, to this point in this gospel, we've heard talk about the hour. And every time the hour is talked about, whenever Jesus is supposed to reveal who he really is, he always kind of poo poos it. He, 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 he nods. Not, not. You remember in the, in the second chapter of this gospel, you remember this very famous story. Mary is with Jesus. They're at a wedding of friends in Cana. There's some problems in the kitchen. Mary sees the servants, waves them over. We're out of wine. It's embarrassing. What are we going to do? Mary says, hey, this is my son. Listen to him. He'll take care of it. And Jesus says, woman, my hour hasn't come yet. And she, apparently Jesus maybe had done this at home. Because Mary looks at Jesus. And if you're a kid and your mom gives you that look, you know, hey, you better get this done, kid. So whatever she said or did, Jesus converts the water into wine. And the wedding festivities go on and the hosts aren't embarrassed their friends are thankful later in john 7 his brothers come though it's a festival of booze all kinds of people come into jerusalem just like now and his brothers say hey cut this hiding in our, you know hiding out stuff come do a public speech whip up some miracles so we can really get people following you and jesus says no 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 my hour has not yet come so what has changed what has happened that Jesus now says, the hour is here. We're ready. Now is the time. Is it the Greeks that are waiting outside for autographs? I don't know. What, what has changed that makes Jesus say, the hour is at hand? 
Well, we just, if we read this whole chapter, we see that it's described as Palm Sunday. What we celebrate is Palm Sunday. Jesus is ridden in triumphantly. People have come in throngs for the Passover. They come out. They lay down their branches, their palm branches, their coats, and Jesus rides in, and they say, the king of Israel, the new king, has come. And so just before our text today, we see this little text about the Pharisees, and they say, we have lost. The whole world is going to see this guy. We got to do something. And I suspect the die has been cast. Those who oppose Jesus, who realize that there's no putting this genie back in the bottle, that so many people ha are listening to what he's saying, that his challenge of the status quo is trouble for anybody who's holding power in the religious scene, the cultural scene, Romans or Jews. And they realize they've got to do something about Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus, in response to the guys who are perhaps representative of the whole world, these Greeks have heard about you. They want to, they want to hear you. In tandem with the Pharisees saying, oh gosh, the whole world seems to have flocked to this guy. And, uh, and then Jesus starts talking about dying. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it won't bear further fruit. He's just foreshadowing of his death and the cross, which John has done before. Pastor Michelle just had it a couple weeks ago. Remember Moses holding the serpent on the pole, which is on one of our stained glass windows here. And the Son of Man, so too, will be lifted up. So there's been this foreshadowing throughout the gospel. And as this is happening... Jesus says, my heart is deeply troubled. What should I say in this moment that I should not face this hour as it's come? Or, and he says, no, of course not. This is why I've come. And here we have something that's very unique to the gospel of, of John. I, I had a friend in ministry who said, you know, reading the gospel of John's account of the, the death of Jesus versus reading the synoptics, the scene together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is like looking at two paintings of Jesus, one by Norman Rockwell and one by Pablo Picasso. They're radically different in what you see, but they're painting the same thing. And let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's take the arrest of Jesus in the garden. You all remember, perhaps, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus goes to the garden, he prays fervently, Father, if this cup can pass from me, but yet not my will, but your will be done. In Luke, he is so anxious, so in agony about the potential for the death he may face for his arrest, for his torture, that he's, his prayers, he's praying, his, this sweat is becoming blood, as Luke records it. Contrast that to John's gospel. It's as if the later gospel writer knew the traditions of the agony Jesus was facing, this tough decision, do I face the cross or not, and says, instead, should I pass up this hour? Should I run from it? No. This is why I have come. As John frames the crucifixion of Jesus, it is from the beginning, the word has come into the world. Humanity chose darkness instead of light, but the light has never been overcome by this darkness. And this light is going to lead all the way to the cross. And on the cross, it's not, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus is hanging there and people are mocking him and the son of the divine is feeling the weight of human brutality and ugliness and death and sin. No, it is, it's finished. I've accomplished this rescue mission I've come to do. And so it's a very triumphant kingship of Christ, a, a very high Christology of Jesus and the cross that is different than how the synoptics tell the story. But I have a confession for you, all of you. During the past year, I have struggled and in many ways lost faith. What? 
Not in God, but in humanity, if I'm honest. I have seen things happen in our country over the past two years that I didn't think we were as a people. Some of the ugliness of, of prejudice and, and hate for each other, different groups and factions. I've been deeply troubled when I see the way that people who have tried to come into the country, whether legal or illegal, but children, you know, in cages. I've seen the greed and ugliness of people, and I, and I think part of that is I've had more time to see the news. And, and in this age, the digital age, is it not true that in a soundbite or a clip, human sin can be captured in a much broader stroke? And if it bleeds, it leads. So a lot of our news feeds are highlighting the depth of human ugliness, human brutality. And it's easy to, if you're bombarded with that all the time, to start to think, we're not that great as God's creatures. And you struggle. I don't know. Maybe you haven't had the struggle. Maybe you just saw peaches, everything's peaches and cream all the time, and you're good. Great. Fantastic. I, I'm glad the ha- cup's half full for you. But for me, I just to name it, it's been a struggle. And so when I hear John talking about the idea that even before Christ is born, God's idea is, I'm going to go down there myself. And again, there's all these hints in John's gospel. The people want to make him king, but Jesus knows their hearts. The disciples want to do X, but Jesus knows not to really trust them because he knows deep down where this path is going to lead to a cross. And yet he says, this is what love looks like, a willingness even to lay down your life for your friends. And when I read John's gospel, I want to say, no, no, go back. I'm not sure we're worth this. And yet, this idea that the love of God is going to continue to pursue us, continue to face us, even when we meet it with our worst, our ugliness, our darkest places, our biggest failures. And it's in those moments, particularly in John's gospel, where we see the strength and depth of a love that says, I'm going to step into it. I'm going to even take it if you give it to me. If you do it to me, and I'm going to love you beyond it and through it. Wow. Wow. So, as, uh, as I was thinking about this text, I was listening to a, a sermon from a colleague called uh, named Jim Somerville. He's a Baptist preacher in Virginia, and he said, you know, to get his head wrapped around this text, you know, Jesus talking about seeds of wheat and things and kernels dying, he said, I called up a a friend who was a longtime deacon in my congregation, and uh, his name's Lou Morrow. Lou, uh, aside from being a pillar in the church, was also a PhD botanist at Virginia, and as I called him up, and he said, this is Jim Somerville, not me, and he said, Lou, can you come talk to me about seed germination so I can understand this text a little bit? And Lou said, how long have you got? And he knew that when he was talking to Lou in other occasions, Lou had a little bit of a gift of gab, and he thought, this could last all of Lent. So I said, I just got about 20 minutes. So Lou came in, and he brought all these bags of grass seed and corn seed and wheat and peanuts. And he said, the first thing Lou did was he he brought a peanut shell, and he he cracked it open, and then, you know, you have the, the paper around the nut. And then he took the nut, and he cut which is really the seed of a peanut plant. He cut, he cut the nut in half and he held it up and he said, you see this little white thing in there that's about the size of a pencil head? He said, that's the, the plant embryo. And out of that is held all the DNA of the peanut plant. If it's an acorn, it's all the DNA of an oak or a fern seed, everything that's going to be a fern. In other words, everything that that seed holds, if the right temperatures of moisture and soil and and sunlight and water occur, that seed will become a plant that replicates everything that that seed holds. 
And, and Jim Somerville was saying, as Lou Morrow was talking to me and talking to me about botany, he said, you know, the, the, the seed begins to diminish. As it nourishes the new plant, it dies. It gives all the nourishment, and the plant sprouts up, the leaves shoot up, the roots go down, and the shell that has protected it, the arms go out. And Jim Somerville said, as, as Lou was talking, he's talking about botany. And I'm seeing this text that Jesus is talking about out of this seed. I'm seeing Christ. I'm seeing Christology. I'm seeing roots go down, uh, seed goes up, sprout goes up, and arms go out to protect the seed, to nourish it. And he said, I got to thinking that if Christ is the seed he's talking about, if everything that he contains in his life, death, and teaching is meant to show us, you know, if he's the DNA that Christ's followers are to have, then as he gives his life, just as John is describing it, in his death, the fruit of that death are plants that are us. We are meant to be that DNA reflection of the life of Christ in our day-to-day -day living. We're the plan. Again, I want to say, wow, are you, maybe we need to rethink this. No, but we are the plan. And I say that because I think sometimes I don't feel like we're up to the plan. But when you really think about it, this idea that we are little Christ, we are the reflection of everything the life, death, and resurrection of Christ is to be. And uh, so in, in, in Antioch, when the term Christian was first used about the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, there was debate of how it was used. Was it derogatory? These little Christians who have amongst their followers slaves and women and children, uh, the poorest of the poor that they say are equal to the wealthy and powerful who won't serve in the army, who eat the body and blood of their Savior. These Christians are weird and unusual people. We can't figure them out, yet they're strangely generous. They're kind to their enemies. They don't do anything that we would normally expect them to do. And yet at the same time, they echo the one they call to serve. And so this text in which Jesus says this seed is going to die and bear fruit the fruit is us. And so I was thinking a lot about this. And um, I had a friend who, uh, my wife and I were in the Chicago Area Runners Association. She started running marathons well before I did. I don't really even like to run, but I was always chasing after her, so I decided I would run a marathon with her. So we were in this training group, and there was a guy who was training us named Joe. He was probably 15 years older than us. And he would lead a little devotion before the running group. And then about 20 miles in, at, you know, weeks of training, he dropped this bombshell and said, I just got a diagnosis that I have cancer, severe, you know, stage three cancer. And my prognosis isn't very good. So I appreciate if I'm going to run this race, but I appreciate if you pray for me. And then he turned on this country song uh, by Tim McGraw called Live Like You Were Dying. And I'm not a big country music fan, but the words of the song were very powerful in that, you know, we always live like we've got tomorrow and we kind of put off for next week or next month or next year something that we really should do in, in the eyes of God. We, we know it's something that God is asking of us, but we put it off. We make excuses. And, it, and in that moment with Joe sharing that I might not have tomorrow, and sharing the story about his fight with cancer. And here's this guy, very inspiring, you know, running this marathon. And yet his body's going through chemo. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, the courage of this man. And it just really kind of put life and death hand in hand that we have this one life, this one moment. And as these Greeks are waiting for Jesus just to meet him because they've heard about the fame, they just want to, you know, shake the hand of the man from the Aspen. And Jesus kind of puts that to the periphery and says, this isn't about, you know, a stage show. This isn't showmanship. This is the way God loves you 
an invitation of God to be born into something far deeper than you've imagined. I'm going to die, he says, but you'll be the fruit, the results, the reflection of that life and death beyond the grave. Little Jesus's Christ followers. So this Lent, where is it that you and I have growth to live like we were dying in a new day for all God has done for us. Amen. After that powerful sermon, I invite you to join me just in a word of prayer and let us move into this time of prayer through a time of silence. God who is ever present. We are gathered in prayer, whether in person or over airwaves. Knowing that in our time, in our place, there truly are moments when we have wished and prayed. that there really was an instruction manual or something clear that we could follow. Guidelines for exactly what you would have us do. Well, over a year now into this pandemic in a society that feels polarized and with a population such as ours. We know in our congregation, we are to lead with love, but God, we're, we're really wanting some specifics on what that looks like every single day with every single person in each situation. And then on days like today, we begin to realize that we have what every generation has had. And that is your presence and your promise. And your very DNA within us. Encouraging us to live that hope and live that love and listen to you and to pray as you would pray as the needs arise and so we pray we pray for healing we pray to be part of that healing we pray for love and to be that love we pray for peace and to be that peace we pray Quite specifically, we pray for Greg and his brother. We pray for Isabel and her family. We pray for all the children of God. We pray specifically for Maddie and Heidi and the Gibson family and what it means as they move. We pray for Shirley Reardon and her family. We pray for the Martinals and the Grayson, as for those who are battling lymphoma, we pray, we pray for the Hogan Boom family, we pray, 
we pray for all of those who we know are in need. We pray for those for whom darkness seems so much stronger than light. We pray. And Lord, most of all, we pray that in some way we can be your hands and feet, your voice. We can be those people you have called us to be, for we are your family here as we unite in one voice praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into this time of offering, we remember that we are here in this time of one great hour of sharing, which means our UCC community is part of all the other United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ communities. We come together because we are stronger together than we can be just individually helping those who are in a time of need, a time of crisis. And that's part of who we are. But in this time of offering, we're also giving thanks because throughout this global time, our community has managed to do just some amazingly wonderful things. And we're in our stewardship campaign. And just one of those things that has started as a seed of an idea is something that we lift up in this offering time today because we go and grow where God calls us to go, and we have gone into new property and into a community kitchen outreach. And we give thanks to God for the vision that is implanted here in this church. Yeah, it's truly a community effort. And it's been great that we've, um, we're not, we started out just doing this on our own on Monday night because our pad shelter was shut down. But then we, we've hooked up with other people and we're, so we're, you know, it, the effect has been that we are able to have this facility open every night of the week. I think people just aren't really aware that there is such a need in right within a few blocks, a few square blocks of our church. There's so many people in need. What if I got real honest? What if I took a risk? What if I opened up my heart and let you see it? What if I took my mask off, trying to fit in? I don't want to be a mannequin. What if I let my guard down? What if I took a breath? What if I wasn't perfect? What if I just a mess what if i bled my soul giving all i could give i'm so tired of pretending i'm coming out of my cages i'm stepping I swung my sword. What if I 
face my demons like I've never done before. What if I hung my banner? What if I chose a side? What if I knew I couldn't lose this time? I'm coming out of my cages. I'm stepping down from my stages. I'm sick and tired of making it. What I wouldn't give to be known. What I wouldn't give to be known. Coming out of my cages. For prayer of thanksgiving, think of the early morning sun as it rises and the way that that warmth coaxes the freezing cold off of the grass and the mist that begins to come and how the earth now, just a few hours later, if you step on that grass, it's warm and how we have been so numb, cold, almost frozen inside ourselves and our homes and how the sun in his rising is so desperately seeking to warm us, calling us to warmth, that we might feel and release and feel so desperately the warmth and life that he is pouring into us. May we give thanks. Amen. We invite you to join in our closing song, Now the Green Blade Rises, verses 1 and 4.
it goes to figure that um, if the seed of Christ dies giving his life in our darkest hours, our own humiliation of the Christ, our torture and death, crucifixion of him, that the seed asks the plants that are produced from him to step into darkness with deep love as well. So from my a famous theologian that I love, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're only a master of evil, Darth, but if you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you possibly could imagine. And out of Obi-Wan come Luke, who by his actions, and Leia, who by her words are disciples. Christ, who gives his life, produces you and me. Let us go with the same kind of courage, depth of love, and heart of hope into the world. Wherever our feet carry us and wherever our voices are heard, in the love of Christ this day, go in peace. Amen. We thank you so much for joining us today, both in person and online, and we invite you to join in our postlude, Still Rolling Stones. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking till love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet under, I thought it was over. And answer the prayer, the voice of a savior.
Thank you. Have a great week.